hormone specificity. Now, hormones are, um, hormones like don't mess around, you know what I mean? It's not like hormones go and, well, I, I, I know I'm ACTH and I'm only supposed to go to your adrenal, but, you know, uh, I went to the pancreas instead. Or I'm ACTH and I know I'm supposed to only go to your adrenal, but, you know, I went to your muscles instead. Hormones are extremely specific. Hormones are extremely specific. In other words, uh, growth hormone has its effect only on growth hormone receptors. LH only has its effect on LH receptors. Uh, so therefore, it is an enormous amount of tissue specificity. Now, one of the only exceptions for this is thyrotropin releasing hormone. Thyrotropin releasing hormone out of your hypothalamus can make prolactin go up. Thyrotropin releasing hormone is one of the only exceptions makes prolactin go up. It's one of the only ones that is an exception. Everything else, very, very specific. Out of the pituitary, out of the hypothalamus, corticotropin releasing hormone makes ACTH, and that's it. Growth hormone releasing hormone makes growth hormone, and that's it. Thyrotropin releasing hormone makes thyro thyroxin, and that's it. <gasps> They're all very specific, except Thyrotropin releasing hormone releases prolactin. Tissue specificity, hormones, okay? Hormones are very, very specific. They don't uh, screw around like this. So therefore, what we have is an incredible specificity out of the hypothalamus. Look at that hypothalamus. Corticotropin releasing hormone, thyrotropin releasing hormone, growth hormone releasing hormone. Ooh, another little quinky dinky here. The hypothalamus. Are they all peptide hormones? Or are they all steroid hormones? How that hypothalamus? They're all peptide hormones. Let me give you a little newsflash. The hypothalamus only makes peptide hormones. The hypothalamus only makes peptide hormones. Hypothalamus, 100% peptide. Pituitary. Peptide hormones, steroid hormones. Pituitary, ACTH, peptide. LH, peptide. FSH, peptide. TSH, peptide. ACTH, peptide. LH, peptide. FSH, peptide. Growth hormone, peptide. Peptide. Hmm. Pituitary peptide. Thalamus, a peptide. Oh my goodness! You mean everything that comes out of my brain is a peptide? Uh huh, uh huh, uh huh, uh huh. Where do the steroids come from? Steroid hormones? <gasps> oh, steroid hormones only at target organs. Hypothalamus peptide? Pituitary peptide. Target organ? Steroid. Peptide, peptide, steroid. Got that? PPS. Peptide, peptide, steroid. Oh. Hypothalamus peptide hormones? Pituitary peptide hormones, target organs, steroid hormones. Thyroxin, steroid hormone. Cortisol, steroid hormone. Testicles, steroid hormone. Ovaries, steroid hormone. Pointing to my ovaries now. Hypothalamus, peptide. Pituitary peptide, target organ, steroid, PPS. Peptide, peptide, steroid. Hormone activity. Normally, is there more hormone or are there more receptors? Normally, is there more hormone or is there more receptors? Normally, is the rate limiting step the amount of the hormone or is the rate limiting step the amount of receptors? And normally, the rate limiting step is the amount of the hormone, not the receptors. See here where it says receptors are not saturated, not saturated. Not saturated, not saturated. That's a big deal. That means there's always more receptors than there is hormone. That means anytime you pop up that hormone level, there's enough receptors to pick it up. That means that anytime you want to have a little more action, pulsatile, but there's enough receptors. Do you know if there weren't enough receptors? That means anytime you needed more activity, you'd have to sit there and wait for the receptors to be made. Can you imagine this? Yeah. 
Got to go to work. If the train's on time, I can get to work by 9.45. Now, <laughs> well, the whole thing is, how'd you like to get to work like that? What are you doing? Waiting for your train? Uh, no, I'm actually waiting for the station to be built. I think going to be late. Oh, yeah. See, normally I'd just be waiting for my protein carrier, my train. I just got made. My protein carrier's coming along. Well, you know, if you had to wait for the number of receptors, that'd be like getting to work in the morning and having to wait for the actual train station to be built. Where are you going? Going on vacation. When are you leaving? As soon as they build the airport. We're not waiting for the number of receptors. We're waiting for the amount of hormone to change. And the receptors are supposed to be made in enough of extras. The same way when you go fly around, you're not waiting for the airport to be built. You're just waiting for the level to go up. Now, it's a big deal. Normally, the number of hormone receptors is not the rate limiting. Not the rate limiting. The number of receptors is not the rate limiting. The same way what controls your ability to fly home is not waiting for the airport to be built. The airports are there. The receptors are there. They're just waiting for you to be secreted back home in pulse style amount. Now, the issue, the issue is disease, downregulation. Now, resistance to hormone action or downregulation. What's the difference between tissue resistance and downregulation? What's the difference between to tissue resistance and downregulation? And the answer is they are the same. They are the same. Now, one of the biggest ones here that goes by this is diabetes. Diabetes, particularly type 2 diabetes, diabetes is the classic example of tissue resistance and downregulation. Diabetes is a disease. That's why there's not enough receptors, because it is a disease. That's the point. You have more insulin than there's receptors for. That's why it's a disease. Because there's not enough receptors, the receptors are saturated. That's why it's a disease, because the receptors are saturated. Now, when you have the hormone constant too much, high all the time, the receptors involute. Now, that doesn't happen with airports, but it's some things like this. If you continue to wear too much perfume, after a while, you don't smell it. What are you doing? You're pouring on too much perfume, the level goes up. After a while, you don't even sense it anymore. Or it's like sending your girlfriend flowers eight times a day. The first few times, it's cute. After that, she doesn't sense it anymore. Try something different. Now, permissive action. Permissive action is also, as an example, is we need to have cortisol to have the permissive action of catecholamines on vascular reactivity. Without cortisol, there's less vascular reactivity of the catecholamines. That's why catecholamines without an adrenal gland don't have as much an effect. Another point of it is this. A patient is admitted for gram-negative shock. They're hypotensive and tachycardic. You inject cortisol, and there is an immediate improvement in blood pressure. What is the explanation for this? A, the effect on the kidneys. B, the potentiation of aldosterone. C, the direct sodium retention by the kidneys. D, a permissive action of, catechol of cortisol on catecholamines. And the answer is D, the permissive action of cortisol on the catecholamines. Also, cortisol has permissive action on glucagon. Glucagon will cause glycogenolysis. Cortisol will have permissive action on glucagon to raise blood sugar levels in glycogenolysis. Thyroid hormone for growth hormone. Catecholamines with cortisol. Cortisol through glycogon for more permissive action to raise the sugars even more. Permissive action, great concept. Plasma hormone levels. Now, the thing with plasma hormone levels, since it goes up and down in peaks, we can't get a sense of what the levels are like all day long because the peaks may happen for a short period of time. 
A very good example of this is growth hormone, which is hard to measure because it's in the middle of the night. That's why we use insulin-like growth factor levels. IGF is the best way to be able to assess growth hormone levels because they are longer half-life. Now, thyroid hormone you can measure at almost any time because thyroxin is made constantly and has a long half-life. Growth hormone is made short duration, short half-life at a hard time when it's hard to come by your house at 3 o'clock in the morning and stick a needle in you when you're asleep in deep sleep. And it's the only one of the hormones that are like that. There's a lot of variation. Hands, ready? A person has Cushing's syndrome as a possibility. You've got a trunkly obese stria, person humping in all the wrong places back here, and you want to do a test for hypercortisolism. What would you do first to assess it? The wrong answer is random cortisol level. Cortisol levels, cortisol levels vary. So therefore, we have to do an overnight dexamethasone suppression test, more specific. You have a person of whom you're thinking about diabetes, one random blood glucose. No bueno, no bueno, ne acha, no good. Uh, so therefore, you have to do two and it's fasting, two and it's fasting for glucose. Cortisol levels, overnight dexamethasone suppression testing, growth hormone levels, no, IGF. So the other thing about blood levels in endocrinology is that we have to understand the biological variability as it goes up and down. That's the point of this slide. The point is pulsatile secretion, diurnal, in other words, cortisol levels are greatest in the morning and least in the evening. Also, age, yes, for men, for testosterone levels. Testosterone levels are always related to your age. In other words, if I had a testosterone level like this, it could be low testosterone compared to if I was 78 years old. My level of testosterone like this for me might be low from my age. If I was 85, it might be terrific. So things vary by age, and the greatest example of this is sex hormones. Now, looking at the measurement of hormone levels, it is hard to be able to measure them in blood so much directly. That's why we tend to use or like to use urine levels. Now, this is not urine analysis in the sense of you think of a urine analysis where we're looking for white cells for an infection. When we do urine analysis for white cells for an infection, that kind of urine analysis, protein white cells. No, what we mean by urine analysis in this sense for, for endocrinology, we mean looking at the fact that when you have cortisol that's bound to albumin, when it gets sugar coated, it will leave the albumin and go into the urine. Sex hormones as well. Cortisol is a very, very good example of this, of sometimes what we can do is look at the amount in the urine as a reflection of the blood levels, and it's more constant. You know, uh, my father, uh, when I was a kid, used to always know what was going on in the house, which is kind of funny because, you know, he was working, he was doing this, he wasn't that. It's not like he's around like a mother 24 hours a day in the house. And uh, finally, I used to, uh, one day I asked him, I said, how is it that you always know what everybody's doing in the house? And my father was a New York State policeman, so he goes like this, because I'm the one that takes out the garbage, kid. I'm the one that takes out the garbage. I know what everybody's doing here because I see what goes in the garbage. That's why if the police are doing surveillance to see if there's a bunch of bad guys, they go and they look into the garbage because whatever you're doing, pieces of it go into the garbage and you can see what's going on in activity by checking what's in the excretion. So it's the same thing here with looking at urine levels. It measures a summary of what's gone on in activity for the last day or the last half a day. A person comes with episodic hypertension, episodic hypertension, flushing, diarrhea, episodic, palpitations, headache, episodic, palpitations, headache, episodic. Well, you're not there measuring the blood pressure day and night and day and night. How do you know if it's truly episodic? The person says that they're flushing all the time. I don't know, I know people that just, they feel flushing every once in a while. I do meal, I doctor, I do think about it. 
Well, how do you know whether that's pheochromocytoma or just panic attacks? Maybe it's just a panic attack. <gasps> urinary catecholamines. Urinary catecholamines. Urinalysis. Urinary catecholamines. A person has episodes where they feel palpitations, headache, and tachycardia. Is it pheochromocytoma or just panic? Urine catecholamines. Ah, urine catecholamines. Now, the reason why polypeptide hormones is not as good in the urine is because they go out in the urine all the time. Peptide hormones go out in the urine all the time, but not for catecholamines and steroid hormones. Now, the 24-hour urine-free cortisol is a very important concept. Why? Because cortisol levels go up and down and all the time, all around. You're anxious, you're running for a cab, you're missing the train, your test is coming, you're depressed. Cortisol levels change all the time. You're feeling happy and relaxed, they go down. You're feeling tense and nervous, they go up. That's why depression is such a common cause of hypercortisolism, falsely. Because what does it matter if the demons are attacking you or the demons in your mind? Well, it's the monsters in your head, right? Well, how do I tell if it's the monsters in your head it's just depression, false positive, versus the fact you really have hypercortisolism. 24-hour urine cortisol is the most accurate test to see if you really have hypercortisolism. 24-hour urine cortisol takes advantage over the variations during the day. 24-hour urine cortisol, if it's normal, you do not have hypercortisolism. Maybe you just have a burst of cortisol because you're anxious. Is it the monsters or the monsters in your head?